In this remote desert area, about 75 miles northeast of Las Vegas, Nevada, the Atomic Energy Commission, in collaboration with the United States Army and Air Force, will conduct the atomic test known as Exercise Desert Rock. In a land where lizards and sand flies are the only living things, a tent city, Camp Desert Rock, now stands. Here, the participating troops, observers, and service units, numbering more than 5,000 people, will live during the exercise. The Army engineers, ordnance, signal corps, military police, and other branches of the service furnish specialized units to augment the 3rd Corps headquarters, which has been designated as responsible for the planning and execution of the military phase of the test. Though lacking in modern conveniences, the camp adequately supplies the basic needs of the men during their stay in the desert. The mess tents, the PX tents, the barber shop, an outdoor cafeteria, and the living quarters all combine to form a typical army installation in the field. Since there are no wells at Camp Desert Rock, it is necessary to haul water to the camp. Vast quantities are trucked in from Indian Springs Air Force Base, 17 miles to the south. Frozen meats and poultry supplement the standard Army field ration. Wind sweeping across the desert provokes violent dust storms and blows down tents. Dust and grit fill the air, making life miserable. Later, the portable shower units provide bathing facilities to wash off the grime. Lieutenant General Joseph M. Swing, 6th Army Commander, arrives to confer with Major General William B. Keene, Commanding General of 3rd Corps and Military Director of the Exercise, the first in which troops will participate as part of an atomic experiment. To offer a basis for military planning, a tactical situation is assumed. In the war tent at Camp Desert Rock, General Keene discusses the various aspects of the exercise with General Swing. The operations plan assumes that a strong aggressor force, estimated at two armies in strength, has landed on the northwest coast of the United States and is moving southeast with the intent of driving the U.S. forces ahead of them. Within a short time, the U.S. 6th Army, consisting of three corps, has been forced to withdraw to a line running from the west coast, north of Los Angeles, through southern Nevada. For the purposes of this exercise, a decision has been made to employ an atomic weapon to destroy this theoretical enemy in front of 3rd Corps and drive him north from his present position. The 3rd Corps plan includes a withdrawal, initially, by one of its infantry divisions into a defensive position. The battalion combat team participating in the exercise is part of this theoretical division. The exercise on the ground will be implemented by one battalion combat team consisting of units of the 11th Airborne Division and the 546th Field Artillery Battalion. The BCT will prepare a defensive position at the test site. Core augmentation units work busily in the forward area to install materiel. In this case, a Bailey bridge. The battalion combat team arrives at Indian Springs Air Force Base with full field equipment. After deplaning, the troops line up, check personal equipment, and prepare to enter buses which will take them to Camp Desert Rock. General Keene is on hand to welcome them. The men carry their individual weapons as well as field packs.
During the trip from the air base to camp, the men have an opportunity to see the type of country in which they will live and work for several weeks to come. At camp, the buses are guided to the BCT area by MPs. Personal equipment, weapons and unit equipment are quickly unloaded. A welcome break from the desert heat finds the men moved in and ready for the work-filled days ahead. Orientation lectures are given on the effects of an atomic weapon. In addition, the men are thoroughly drilled in the part they will play in the exercise. Military police, truck drivers, evaluators and observers are briefed in detail. An understandable concern is usually expressed by troops about the dangers of entering an atom-blasted zone. In air bursts, like the one which the men will see, and the type which would normally be used against troop concentrations, no serious amount of radioactivity remains in the ground. In order to evaluate the effect of the atomic weapons, nine test positions have been set up at varying distances from ground zero, the exact point at which the bomb will be detonated. At the battalion combat team area, the men will dig in and construct foxholes and machine gun emplacements. A convoy carries them to within marching distance of this spot. Roll calls are taken frequently to ensure that no man will be left in the potentially dangerous forward area. The BCT begins preparation of its defensive position. Foxholes and gun emplacements will conform to standard Army field fortification plans. Bulldozers and other earth-moving machines scoop out gun emplacements as construction of forward area installations continues rapidly. Hundreds of sandbags must be filled. Concrete pillboxes and numerous foxholes remain to be dug. Communications are established and tested. An artillery piece is maneuvered into position in one of the dug-in emplacements. Later, evaluators will inspect the piece to see if it was affected by the bomb. During a break, sandwiches prepared at camp are eaten on the spot before the men move on to a new position and new tasks. On D-1, Two film badges are issued to each man of the BCT. These are used to measure cumulative radiation. One will be carried by the man during the test and will record the amount of radiation to which he has been subjected. The second badge, left with the individual weapon in the BCT area, will record the amount of radiation he would have received had he been present at that point during the blast. Now on D-1, the BCT has almost completed preparations in the forward area. As the final step, weapons with film badges firmly attached are carefully placed in the individual field fortifications. Here they will remain until retrieved after the detonation on D-Day.
core augmentation units are completing the positioning of other test materiel at distances ranging from approximately one half mile to three and one half miles from ground zero. Sheep are placed in a variety of emplacements and shelters. Some are placed in enclosures at ground level, while others are placed in below ground positions. This sheep is being placed in a 10 foot square emplacement below ground level. Tactically placed personnel field fortifications have been laid out to test their effectiveness against an atomic explosion. Test samples of several types of ammunition are placed in exposed positions above ground with corresponding samples being placed in protected positions. As D-1 draws to a close, all troops are withdrawn from the forward area test site, which now becomes a no man's land until after the detonation of the A-bomb on D-Day. On the morning of D-Day, convoys carrying the battalion combat team, radiological safety personnel, effects evaluators, and official observers wind their way through the mountains on the 27-mile trip from Camp Desert Rock to the test site. In a parking area near the observation position, the men detruck in the cold of early morning. The observation point is about seven miles from ground zero. General Mark Clark, Lieutenant General Swing, and Major General Keene, together with other observers, are present to witness the blast of the bomb, which will be dropped from a high-flying aircraft. High Department of Defense officials and congressional representatives await H hour. Final briefings have brought the men up to date on the various conditions of the test. It is believed they will experience less fear during the blast because they have learned that radioactive elements from air bursts are carried into the stratosphere in a cloud where they mix rapidly with the upper air currents. The bomb will be detonated only if all predetermined requirements are met, including weather conditions. BCT personnel are interviewed to determine the effect of orientation lectures. Sergeant O'Brien, I understand you're the acting first sergeant of your company. Uh, yes, sir, that's right. How many of your men do you think would volunteer to go up and be in one of those foxholes when the bomb went off? Uh, I'd volunteer, I guess, with about a half a dozen. At least half a dozen? Yes, sir. 
Uh, you know, that's quite a loud noise that bomb makes when it goes off. Do you think it would do you any harm? No, I don't think the noise would, sir, no. How about radiation? Do you think there's much danger from radiation? Well, radiation is the least of the worries that the men are thinking about. I think most people thought that radiation was the greatest danger, didn't they? What did they learn different? We were, prior to our instructions here, we received a very thorough briefing before we even came in this close to contact with it. You feel that those instructions have given you confidence in your ability very much to so. very protect much. yourself? Yes, sir. How about the exercise you're going through up there? Is that uh, something you think the men will go through with all right? Yes, sir. I think they'll do very well in it. They've been, they're mentally ready for it. They're eager ready to go. Good. Well, we're glad to have you here. As each hour approaches, those men without protective glasses are instructed to sit down on the ground and face away from the blast. The bomb has left the plane. Within 30 seconds will come the thunderous roar of the explosion seven miles away. The typical mushroom-shaped cloud boils upward. troops are participating is designed to dispel much of the fear and uncertainty surrounding atomic radiation and the effects of these rays. Casualties from an atomic explosion are estimated to be in the following proportions. From blast and missile, 60%. From flash burns and heat, 30% and from radiation, 10%. Post-blast interviews are conducted. Sergeant Gutierrez, you've seen a lot of action. Tell us what, just exactly how this thing looked to you. Think it's much of a weapon? I think it is, sir. Tell us about it. How'd it look? Well, my point of view, I think it's a terrific weapon, and I'd hate to be under it. Would you like to be any closer to it than you were? If I did, sir, I think I'd dig the hole a little deeper. Sergeant Brewster, can you tell us uh, whether you think that the orientation you had for this weapon prepared you for what you saw out here? Yes, sir, it did. How and about the fear that you felt? Did they prepare you against that? Yes, sir, they did. They told us enough so that, well, our fear was cut down so much more than it was before the orientation that we hardly had any fear at all. Would you have a was. confidence that uh, you'd be able to go right in there now and carry out your tactical mission a few yes, minutes sir. after the blast? Yes, sir. How close do you think, now that you've seen it, you'd be willing to be? Well, sir, I'll tell you that after I see them positions up ah, there. Ah, well, you know you dug some foxholes about yes, uh, a few miles away, and you're going to see just what uh, yeah. things looked like in there. Yes, sir. What are you going to do after you look at your positions? Well, if we look at positions, we'll pick up our weapons, and we'll move in toward ground zero, see what the area looks like in there and toward... Did you feel uh, now, after it's all over, that you've uh, had a big letdown, that uh, there's any disappointment in this weapon? No, sir, there's no disappointment. No disappointment? It's certainly a powerful weapon. I can't understand why anything so, so beautiful can be so destructive. Radiological safety teams sent out to measure residual radiation report that the forward area is safe to enter. As they're part of the tactical exercise, the BCT and trucks to move up to its previously prepared position. Here, the men detruck and move forward to examine their foxholes and weapons. Soon each man will see for himself what his chances for survival would have been had he been in his foxhole at the time of the blast. In recovering their weapons from the foxholes, the men find little damage done to either the weapon or the dug-in position. 
Information from the radiological instruments indicate that a negligible amount of radiation exists at this position, approximately two miles from ground zero. Film badges are removed from weapons and will be turned over to technical personnel for processing. The BCT receives a briefing in which the condition of equipment and emplacements is discussed. Preliminary observations indicate that a man in a foxhole caught this close to an atomic explosion would be reasonably safe. The commanding officer of the battalion combat team gives the signal for the advance toward the BCT objective, an area approximately one half mile from ground zero. In a formation of 15 columns abreast, the team moves across the desert, which only a short time before was subjected to the atomic blast. In theory, they are launching an attack against a foe which has been stunned by an atomic weapon used in close tactical support of ground troops. The radiological safety teams, with their detection instruments, have moved out ahead of the troops. The evaluators who follow shortly after will examine field fortifications and equipment for evidence of blast and heat damage as a basis for reports to be rendered by the effects evaluation group. Here, an ordnance evaluator finds a carbine-mounted snooper scope only slightly damaged, damage which can be repaired in the field. In some cases, the paint on tanks, recoilless rifles, howitzers, and other metal equipment was seared and scorched by the intense heat on the side nearest the bomb. Portions of a test bridge were damaged. Some weapons are blown over. Rubber parts and sections of tires are found to have melted. Telephone equipment sustained the blast and heat without serious damage. The evaluators and observers examine field fortifications and find them intact even at positions closest to ground zero, though heat has scorched wooden supports. Sheep below ground level in zigzag trenches show no visible sign of blast or heat effects. However, those in pens on the ground surface sustained wool burns. Blood samples are taken. A 30 caliber machine gun is checked for radiation. Other standard army field equipment and vehicles show considerable damage from heat and blast. Portions of sandbags exposed to the heat were burned. Some of the portable water storage tanks of the type used in Camp Desert Rock were partially collapsed from blast while others caught fire and burned to the ground. The metal canister is all that remains of a test gas mask. The canvas on vehicles was blown off and burned. Clothing on a dummy is scorched. A field desk is overturned and partially charred. At the closest position, telephone wire is blown down and the poles scorched and broken. Fabric samples of different types show reactions to heat and blast. Field wire and telephones give evidence of scorching and burning. In touring the test site, it has become increasingly evident to the observers that subsurface emplacements offer considerable protection from nearly all but direct hits or low overhead bursts. The battalion combat team continues its march toward positions closer to ground zero. As they enter the blast area within an hour after the detonation, they realize the danger of radiation sickness from an air burst is slight. A zone pole several hundred yards from ground zero is inspected by a radiological safety man. Only slight evidence of radioactivity is found. The combat team proceeds with its tactical mission, continuing the simulated attack by passing through a portion of the bombed area. In these closer positions, the men inspect the sheep and the zigzag trenches.
At one of the test positions, the men are briefed concerning damage to the various test positions which they have just seen. Later, the effects and evaluation group will prepare detailed reports on the results of the test for distribution to persons concerned with the tactical use and development of atomic weapons. Before entrucking for camp, BCT participants in the test are inspected with radiological detection instruments for evidence of radiation. A thorough head-to-foot examination will reveal any accumulation of radioactive material. Vigorous sweeping with a broom removes contaminated dust and dirt from shoes and clothing. As exercise Desert Rock is concluded, initial reactions are, it is possible to utilize an atomic weapon in close support of ground troops in those cases where the conditions surrounding its use are carefully considered and where participating troops are fully indoctrinated in the capabilities and effects of an atomic weapon.